The three wise men who give gifts to Jesus uh, are known as the Magi. You probably know that term, the Magi. I suppose it's magus in Latin is wise men, perhaps. Magi. And uh, one of the most famous short stories in the world is one written by O. Henry, uh, an American short story writer, and it's called The Gift of the Magi. And I don't know if you had to read it in school, but I remember in Ireland we had to read it, you know, for, for an examination purpose. So The Gift of the Magi, the short story, is about a young couple who loved each other more and more every year they were married. And yet they had very little money. And so one Christmas came along when they had no money at all for buying presents. And in fact, uh, they had only two things in their possession that was of any value at all or that they were proud of at all. One was the uh, young woman's long blonde hair, which came right down to her waist, and they were both very proud of that. And the other was a gold watch that the husband had that had been given to him by his father. Those were the two most precious things that they could be proud of. They had very little else in their home. So the week before Christmas, they went out round the stores shopping like everybody else, except that they had no money and they couldn't buy anything. And uh, they would keep going around the same stores, especially two stores. There was one that had two golden combs, a pair of golden combs in it that they both knew would look just beautiful in the wife's hair. And uh, the other store had a beautiful gold chain that would look magnificent on the husband's watch. And they used to wander around those stores during that week repeatedly, even though they felt they have no chance of ever buying those things. And so Christmas morning arrived, and they came down to the living room where they usually exchanged their presents, and uh, the husband could see uh, a kind of light of excitement in his wife's eyes. And she could see the same in his eyes, except that his changed to horror when he saw that she had cut off all her hair. And uh, so dejectedly, he brought out the present that he had bought for her. You can guess, the golden combs. But I mean, she had now no hair to put them on, so it was useless. However, she kind of picked herself up and continued to seem to be excited, and she brought out her present to him, which was the chain, the gold chain for his watch. And he smiled and said, well, you obviously sold your hair to buy the chain for my watch, but I don't have a watch. I pawned my watch to buy the combs for your hair. And O. Henry says, these two foolish people stumbled on the central factor in giving gifts, that of love. That if there isn't love behind giving a gift, it's of no value. And if there is love, it doesn't much matter if the gift works out right or not. It's the love that counts. And that's why, loved ones, Paul leads us into the subject that we're going to begin talking about over these next few weeks. You remember, he's been telling us about the gifts that God gives us, how he has given every one of you a certain gift that you can exercise in order to bring his world back under his will. And then he says, now those gifts are no use unless the same thing governs them as govern the heart of the one who gave you those gifts. And the God who is your creator who gave you those gifts gave you those gifts because he loves you. And really, 
unless you are governed by that same love in your hearts, those gifts will bring only coldness to the people that they're exercised upon, and they will bring only death to you yourself. And that's what Paul begins to talk about. He begins to talk about love. The love with which you and I are to exercise the gifts that we've been given. And it might be good, you know, to, to turn to the verse and, and to see how God puts it to us. It's Romans chapter 12. And verse 9, Romans 12 and verse 9. And you see the way in verse 6, just to remind you what Paul has been talking about, verse 6, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, he who teaches in his teaching, he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who contributes in liberality, he who gives aid with zeal, he who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. In other words, some of you are good at encouraging other people. Some of you are good at advising and counseling other people. Some of you are good at giving gifts financially to others. Some of you are good at helping other people. But all those things are useless unless they're motivated, you see, by this next verse. Let love be genuine. So it doesn't matter how great a counselor you are, doesn't matter how great an organizer you are, if your love is not genuine, that gift will not bring that person under God's will or closer to him. And it's interesting, you know, God assumes, doesn't he? He kind of assumes that love will be the central factor in our lives. You see that? He doesn't say, look, I want you to love. He actually says, let love be genuine. I'm assuming that you people who are the recipients of so much love from the person that made the earth, and that's pretty obvious, isn't it? I mean, where did you get your hair from? Where did I get my ears from? Where did we get our bodies from? Where did we get the flowers from? We're all in the same boat, loved ones. There's nothing that we have got that we have not been given. And so that's why our Creator assumes, now I assume you loved ones realize that the whole basis of everything that you see around you is love. Somebody has loved you to give you all these things. So I'm assuming that you all know that the central factor in life is love. I'm assuming that you know that. I don't feel I should have to tell you to love. It must be so obvious to you that somebody has loved you a lot to give you everything that you possess today. I'm assuming that you know that I am love and that I am your creator who have made you in my image and therefore the only way life will work is if the heart of it all and the basis of it all is love. I don't know if you've got that, loved one. I think it's easy in our world, in a world of uh, Yaroslavsky uh, and a world of Siberia, uh, and a world of recession, it's maybe easy to lose t sight for a moment of the fact that everything we have has been given to us. Everything that each of us in this room has has been given to us, and it's been given by somebody who loved us. Somebody wanted to give us that, and somebody loved us. The only basis of life is love. I don't know if you've really settled that in your own mind. We've done our best maybe to wipe it out. But God assumes that, you see. He doesn't say, now I'm going to tell you a big secret. Now I want you to love. No, he doesn't. He just says, listen, I'm assuming that you all know love is the basis of life. What I'm saying is let love be genuine. And that's it. Our, our RSV says, let love be genuine. Uh, the King James says, let love be without dissimulation. 
And uh, Philip says, let us have no imitation Christian love. And uh, the Living Bible says, don't just pretend that you love others, really love them. Don't just pretend that you love others, really love them. And the Greek is, hey, agape, which is the love, the love. It's interesting, the love. And let it be an hypocritos. An hypocritos. An is not hypocritos. You can guess it. The U became a Y in English, and it becomes our word hypocrite. And so the Greek says literally, let your love not be hypocritical. Let it not be pretending love. Let it not be dissembling love. Let your love be undissembled. Let it be without dissimulation. Let it be simple and straight and plain. Don't pretend about it. I don't know if you know the, the Greek actors and where the word Hippocrates came from, but it means under a mask. If you know anything about Greek tragedy, they used to dress in masks, partly because, of course, the people were so far away from them, and they wanted the characters to be plainly known, so they put a mask on that uh, plainly showed that the guy was a villain or was a good guy. And so the actors acted behind masks. And so God says, let your love not be something that is hidden behind a mask. Let your love not be something that is disguised or something that pretends or something that assumes a character. Don't be assuming a character that you aren't truly and really inside in your heart. Let your love be real. That's what God says to us this morning. And over the next weeks, we're going to spend a lot of time trying to find out what real love is and contrasting it with all the wrong ideas that we in our 20th century have of love. So we're going to spend some time on this verse. But loved ones, could we just settle this fact this morning, that God says to us, now I'm assuming from all the signs that you people have around you, that you know you exist only because somebody else has loved you. So I'm assuming that you yourselves see that your lives will only work if they're run through and flooded and surrounded by your love. Now, I'm saying to you, let your love be real. Let it be real and true and genuine, not something that you put on. And the basis of all that, you see, is, is those verses that I think many of us have read before it. They're in 1 John. 1 John, and it's chapter 4. And verse 7. 1 John 4, and verse 7. It's page 1067. 1067. 1 John 4 and verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and he who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent a son to be the expiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No man has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. What is love unfeigned and love undissembled? Oh, Jesus, hanging, bleeding on the cross, and saying to you, I want to assure you that all the evil that you have in your heart that has to be destroyed, I have taken into my own heart, and I am bearing it through hell's fire so that it will be destroyed forever, and so that you will be able to go into my Father's presence without fear of extermination. 
That's love unfeigned. You know, it's no bluff. The man's dying. He's dying. And he's telling you that he's taken the worst that you have produced in your heart into his own heart freely because he loves you. That's love that gives completely and without reservation gives itself for the highest purpose as known to man. That's what real love unfeigned and undissembled is. And so, loved ones, I, I just ask you and ask myself, is love the basic attitude in each of our lives? Is love the basic attitude that you and I have to the people that we work with? That's right. To our colleagues. Do we love our colleagues at work? Do we love the fellow students we have in our classes at school? Is love the governing attitude in our relationship to them, or is it competition, rivalry, trying to keep one up? Is our basic attitude to our people that we live with, either our family or our relatives or our roommates, is the basic attitude love? Do we love? Is our life girded round about with love? And I'd ask you, well, is it? You know? and, and it is horrifying, isn't it, how we can so often find that our life is, is governed by paranoia, maybe, or governed by competitiveness, or governed by insecurity or governed by struggling to keep our heads above water, but not governed by love. And yet, God is saying to us, look, that's the only thing that makes life work. And could it not be that that's why you and I have so much trouble with things in life? Could it be that what your marriage needs is a bit more just love? Very interesting these days when we talk so much about communication. And we all think that communication will solve everything in marriage. Well, communication helps, but what marriage most needs is love. And it's the same in our labor relationships, in our businesses. What they most need is love. And actually, you know if you and I were talking individually together alone without all these other people around, you know that you'd say, yeah, boy, love has some kind of softening effect on me. When I see somebody really loves me, boy, I'd do anything for them. It makes everything worthwhile, makes everything possible if a person loves me. And loved ones, that's why I say to all of us this morning, God is saying to us, let love which is the only cement that will hold all of life together. Let love be real and genuine and undissembled without dissimulation. Let it be genuine. Let it not be something that you assume in order to impress somebody with. Because the truth is, even if love sells its hair to buy a chain for your watch, and you sell your watch to buy combs for love's hair, somehow the Christmas is the greatest success because love was there. And it's the same with our lives. Love makes everything work. So let us accept what God says, that love is to be the basic attitude of each of us in our whole lives towards everyone we meet, the drivers on the road, the people in the stores, and let our love be genuine. Over the next weeks, I pray that God will make this clear to us what love is. But I would encourage us to look at different parts of our lives 
and see, is there any love in them? Is there any love in my relationship to my wife? Is there any love in my relationship to my friends at work? And my surprise is, you know, how cold things have been allowed to get for us. Let us pray. Dear Father, we've known from we were children that God is love. We know that off by heart. We know too, Lord, that all the songs say what the world needs is love. And we talk a lot about it. But Lord, we do realize how little of it there is in our own attitudes and how hard life can become when we put love into the background. Lord, we would bring it into the foreground now. When we consider the people that we work with tomorrow and the people that we study with, Lord, we're going to start showing them some love. Just show them some love, some understanding. Just forbear a little and stop just dealing with them justly, as we think, according to what they deserve. But begin to deal with them the way you've dealt with us, beyond and far better than we deserve. Lord, we're going to start dealing that way with our friends and our relatives. Father, when we see how many arguments we get into and we think we're right just because we've made a valid point, Lord, we see that we would be finished if you argued that way with us. You have graciously refused to press your rights. You have graciously refused to point the spear the whole way home. And Lord, we would begin to love our friends and our dear ones and begin to allow love and the Holy Spirit who brings love to introduce some restraint and some grace into our lives together. Lord, we thank you that we're only here because of your love. And it's no wonder to us that love is what makes the world go round and it's what makes our lives work. So Lord, we commit ourselves to beginning to love and to love in reality and in truth during these coming days. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and evermore. Amen.